Welcome to Universal Studios Japan, Hollywood in the Far East. In the back lots, the stars shine 24 hours a day. No wonder tourists flock here in their millions. We're about to take you behind the scenes of one of the busiest theme parks in the world, to a city within a city. The bustling back lots of USJ, Universal Studios Japan. You'll see how Hollywood's heavyweights join forces for one of the most ambitious and expensive productions of all time. So, ikimashou. You'll get to see the tricks of the trade in the wildest Wild West show in the East. Then there's the dynamite charged Waterworld show. We'll let you in on some of the secrets of the business of show in the land of the rising sun. Universal has come a long way since the barnstorming days of the silent era 80 years ago. During the Great Depression, Universal Pictures was releasing a movie a week. It was the tonic America needed at the time, and Hollywood hasn't looked back since. In 1964, Universal threw its doors open to the public with the first of its theme parks. Looking back, there may have been a young Spielberg or a young James Cameron in this crowd, inspired by seeing their silver screen heroes up close. In the four decades since it's opened, more than a hundred million people from around the globe have visited Universal Studios in Los Angeles and in Orlando, Florida, which opened in 1990. But here's a fact that may surprise you. After the United States, the number one consumer of Hollywood movies in the world is Japan. Well, Japan is fond of anything American, really, if you think about it. Um, and there's a lot of people who are looking for things to do. Movies always been a big thing, so um, I guess that's why American movies are popular. So it was only fitting that when Universal Studios decided to build its first theme park outside of the United States, Osaka, Japan was the first choice. The most obvious place for a Universal Studios would be some place in Japan because the Japanese love film. Director Steven Spielberg saw a great opportunity when he was appointed special creative consultant to Universal Studios Japan. After all, this country has embraced his movies like no other. They've always loved movies and they've, uh, they've been uh, uh, tremendous supporters of Hollywood motion pictures, of American films. And, uh, you know, my first successes were in Japan. While the United States and Japan share a passion for movies, there were some cultural differences to consider. Japanese movies, traditionally, we have um, very sad endings. That's the way it's done. But, um, of course, Hollywood movies have happy endings. So it's strange. Maybe we're looking for something different. But if there's one thing Spielberg knows, it's how to win over an audience, no matter where they are. Kind of takes them on a bit of an adventure in a theater where they're able to, you know, see how adventure films and, are put together and what part the imagination plays in bringing all these things to reality. And then after that, you know, they're able to actually move through the screen itself, which is something I've always wanted to do, is to walk through the screen. The involvement of Spielberg, James Cameron, and three other Oscar winners meant one thing. This was going to be entertainment on a grand scale. Three years and $1.5 billion in the making, it really is bigger than Titanic. On March 31st, 2001, Universal Studios Japan opened for business. The park is about 100 acres. We have 18 major attractions that are designed after uh, blockbuster movies. 
What we've been able to do here is kind of take the best of the best from the other Universal theme parks and incorporating those with some other uh, design concepts that are kind of uniquely Japanese. We've created a park that uh, is about the same size but actually can handle quite a few more people than our parks in the United States. At the box office, it was an instant hit. Eight million people would walk through these gates in the first year of operations. It was just what the local economy needed. One, two, three, three. The Wild West Show is the centerpiece of Universal Studios theme parks. You know the story. A couple of tough guys break into a bank. There's a fight. And a shootout. Then someone falls off a building. The guy in the white hat saves the day. Slapstick humor played out to the setting of America's legendary frontier past. It's timeless. And if this audience is anything to go by, nothing is lost in the translation. <laughs> Looks like a surefire hit, right? But there's a secret to winning this audience over. Cultural differences between Japan and the United States meant that the show had to be modified. A Japanese spin on an American classic. It's funny because every show has to be custom made. Every nationality, every country, they have a different sense of humor. These guys, they, they, there's a lot of irony. They enjoy irony. They like going from yin to yang, and that's how, that's how you get them in this uh, attraction. Uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time watching the Japanese, and we try different things to see how it works. Uh, sometimes, sometimes what we think is funny isn't. What we think works doesn't. We go back to drawing board, and, and you'll find some things that you never thought would work, and it's the greatest thing. In the few months that he's been in Osaka, stunt actor Christian Stokes has tuned into the Japanese sense of humor by spending as much time as he can mixing with people like this. <laughs> Comedians sometimes call this working the room. We play baseball. <laughs> it's all for fun, but Christian uses this time to see what goes down well and to gather material for the show. <laughs> for instance, you've got your Pokemon and, and the cute characters. Everybody, they're into the cute, cuddly kind of things. And I play a bad guy, so I run through the through the entire thing just growling. And, uh, and there's a scene where I pop into the door, come out, I'm spinning around. And for just a minute, I, I take on this cute little uh, characterization. And I'm chasing the birds, and I pass out, and I get a good response from the audience. I was playing around one day trying to say, well, let's just see what happens. And, and so it's been a keeper. So that's an example. That's an example that would, I'd get thrown, I'd have tomatoes thrown at me in Germany or probably in the States too. So. <laughs> Mixing Japanese dialogue with English posed a few interesting challenges for the Wild West show. <laughs> I've gotten comments from some individuals that some of our actors and entertainers that use a heavily Osaka accent sometimes seems out of place. And apparently some of the American actors that we had, had trained, we trained with an Osaka accent. So we've gone back and corrected some of that so it's more of a traditional Japanese sound. Next, we'll go behind the scenes as Universal puts together a cast of legends. Welcome, Marilyn's. How are you? Great. When something's this hot, this wild, this lucky, only two words can describe it. Vegas, baby. Starting January 12th, the Travel Channel brings you the best of the strip on Vegas Week. It's the ultimate insider's look, hosted by Sin City's own Penn & Teller. 
For all new Vegas shows all week long, cash in with Vegas Week. Starts January 12th. It's rising at Universal Studios Japan. 8 a.m. Opening time. Many of these people have already been waiting at the gates for two hours. In Japan, standing in a line has become a national pastime. Japan is the most densely populated country in the world. So as you can imagine, from a young age, we learn to stand in queues, be patient, no such things as crowd rage or pushing, shoving. It does happen, of course, but um, we learn very quickly that the pa more patient we are and the more polite we are, the faster things move. If I want to get from point A to point B, the most efficient way of doing it is patiently, quietly, and politely. And here's the proof. The gates open, but instead of everyone pouring in like it was a Bloomingdale's sale, it's all very civilized. And I will say with the Japanese groups, they're, they're really very much used to operating in large groups, whether it be in train stations or in the major urban areas. And we find that within the park, the flow of people from place to place is more orderly than it would be in the United States. The Japanese buy their day passes to the park six months in advance. 10,000 will sweep through in the first wave. Tens of thousands will follow. You know, in any given day, we'll do tens of thousands of visitors, and a big week for us would be hundreds of thousands of people. And a big day and a big week is really about twice the size of our park in Hollywood, so it's a very busy big park here. Now here's something you may not have noticed yet. Look around. People everywhere. The rides are ticking over. But where are the lines of people? Well, here's the secret. The park is actually designed to hide the lines from view. In the American parks, a lot of the queues where people are waiting for the attractions are, tend to be in the street. And the queues here are very well hidden. So the park was designed to handle larger crowds, and it does extraordinarily well at that. It's a trick of the eye. People will wait for up to two hours for some rides, but the lines are hidden from view off the street. When the decision was made to spread Universal's wings to Japan, a worldwide talent search was undertaken. <laughs> From the very get-go when we came out of the gate, we were looking for the top talent in the world. We're looking for authentic impersonators. All right, ladies, right in the line across, please. The Travel Channel got behind the scenes um, with casting director right Greg Berkheimer. The spread X. Um, 68 is first. He left no stone unturned in a search to find the next Marilyn. Welcome, Marilyn. How are you? Great. And the next Charlie Chaplin. You just want to see uh, your famous style. All right? And the thing with Charlie Chaplin is what's so great. He's a silent film star. You don't have that language barrier. It is all about facial expression. And we're looking for people that have researched the character. Marilyn, what's your favorite movie that you've made? My favorite movie? Yes. Some Like It Hot. Who's your favorite co-star? Very difficult. Would it be wrong if I said Jane Russell? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite movies. We're looking for talent all over the world. And if we didn't find them, they found us. We had a lot of people that flew in, whether they were from Alaska, or Denmark, all over. So if we didn't go to their neck of the woods, they found us. Great. Name and number, please. <laughs> Why, thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. <laughs> around 160 roles total that fit foreign performers. And then we have almost the same, which are Japanese performers, because we have a lot of singer-dancer types. Thank you. 
even Whoever gets the nod will be performing to 8 million visitors a year. It's not a bad job. Fantastic. We've done that twice now with the Warner Brothers and Disney and, you know, he's universal, so trial three. <laughs> Charlie and Marilyn are two of the most recognizable showbiz faces in the world. But not every American classic has gone down as well with the Japanese public. For example, in Orlando, Florida, this ride, based on a 1970s movie, simulates what happens in a subway during an earthquake. But here's a secret. You won't find this ride at Universal Studios Japan. It simply wouldn't go down well in a country where earthquakes are a constant threat. And some attractions that seem tailor-made for Japan were not popular at all. This year, Godzilla is out, but Jurassic Park is in. This is just to welcome people to the restaurant. At Universal Studios Japan, there's a dinosaur at every turn. A Jurassic restaurant featuring Jurassic meals. Jurassic pastry, and of course, the Jurassic Park ride. But there was one thing about the Jurassic Park experience Universal had to change for Japanese visitors. And it wasn't the wait of up to two hours to get on the ride. It was this. The 75-foot drop is the last big thrill on the ride. But the splash was just a little too big for many of the locals. We like to dress well and we don't want to get wet. If you're from California, like in Hollywood, you've got the great sunshine. You can get wet, you'll be dry in 15 minutes. But in Osaka, where Universal Studios is, it's, it's not all that sunny all the time. So if you get wet, you stay wet. But here's a secret. Universal de-splashed the final drop by making the pool more shallow and building splash guards onto the sides of the boat. The truth is, you still get pretty wet. Coming up inside Universal Studios Japan, the secrets to surviving as a high-flying stuntman. Universal Studios Japan, Jaws is putting the bite on a new generation of unsuspecting tourists. When Steven Spielberg directed the original Jaws in 1975, the working title for the film was Stillness in the Water. <laughs> But once the star of the show surfaced, there was no other name it could be but Jaws. The star of this show is a 35-foot, three-ton steel and fiberglass monster. The mechanical shark cuts through the water at 20 feet per second. That's the same speed that a real great white shark will attack. You know, theme parks have become technological marvels. The control systems that would be, for instance, in a JAWS vehicle are just, you know, uh, 21st century state-of-the-art. In dry dock, JAWS is getting some running repairs. This is a view of the shark the public rarely sees. And here's another secret. Steven Spielberg's pet name for the shark is Bruce, which also happens to be the name of Spielberg's lawyer. Also on the blocks in the model workshop is this 30-foot replica seaplane, the scene stealer in the Waterworld show. The detailing on these models is every bit as stringent as it is for a real Hollywood movie. The difference is, Models like this are used every day, year-round, so they have to be durable. This plane is in the workshop more often than not. When you see the stunt it performs, you'll understand why.
Potter World, the 1995 movie starring Kevin Costner, cost $170 million in the making, then bombed at the box office. In fact, more people have probably come to see the Waterworld show at Universal than saw the movie itself. It's been the surprise hit of Universal Studios Japan. You know, I just think it's the basic drama side of it. It's got a great plot, it's got great action, uh, it's got the explosion side to it, it's got the, the great hero and heroine uh, that are fundamental parts of a lot of Japanese dramas. And so I just think it's worked very well for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of it's the sizzle, some of it's the plot. Well, there's not much of a plot, but there is plenty of sizzle. This show features stuntmen from seven countries. The cliff diver is a former champion. So is this guy. Some of these guys are on loan from Jackie Chan's stunt team. Every stunt lives or dies by split-second timing. For all the stunt crew at Universal, the secret to survival is simple. It's rehearsal, 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 rehearsal. We spend, we spend hours and hours out here rehearsing the, the gig. Uh, we walk through it several times, and then we pick up the level of the speed until we do run full speed. Christian does seven performances at the Wild West stunt show a day. 22 minutes of performance. A stunt every 13 seconds. And if any one of these stunts goes wrong, it could result in serious injury. But not if you know what you're doing. Christian is now gonna let us in on a few tricks of the trade. In movies you see all the time, people get hit over the head with bottles. Well, these are the bottles that they use. It's, uh, it's not glass, it's something called uh, polystyrene, and it's candy glass. I'm gonna demonstrate on my good friend and arc foe, <laughs> Scott Sarich, he's the, uh, uh, the sheriff in this show. I'm gonna demonstrate just how deadly these bottles can be. You ready for this? No. Get ready, okay. it's coming! Come on. Oh yeah! And there you have it. <laughs> And how does this guy survive a fall down the well? From the audience, it looks like it's, oh, I don't know, 25 feet deep. So here we're going to demonstrate just how deep this thing is for you right here. Here we go. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's about, oh, I'd say four feet deep. Now, in this thing, we have a water cannon. This water spray shoots up and just bombards the entire audience with water. And, uh... There you have it, wet and wild, right here. And the sheriff is working without a net. This is uh, called a slide for life from show business. They also call it a slide for death. As the sheriff slides on a pulley system, slides all the way down, transfers from one circus loop to this circus loop, hangs on this, and then when, it's, when he's ready to fall, the TD releases him on the gunshot. And this is a pneumatic air pressure system where it releases. And there's, there's one piston. The sheriff swings. He swings back. The second piston releases. And then he's down on the ground by then. It's about 20 foot off the ground. The high fall is probably the most dangerous stunt of all. Yeah! We take... Uh little blocks of wood and we add these to the guide rails here. These are uh, metal sheaths that go over these, these boards. It gives the impression I'm falling through solid wood. And we connect this in the center. Wood in uh, Japan is very expensive, so we make these small pieces to, to be <laughs> a little economical. We take these four and we try and put it down the middle of the seam to where I'll, I'll be falling. And I want my body to be in a perfect line with these things, so as long as I'm on this seam, I'm good. Here comes the important part, the padding. Once again, I try to pyramid these to where when I land, I've got my seam here, so there's, there's not a whole lot stopping the boards from breaking under me. And this is the, I land in the center of this pad, so the combination of these pads on top of the board on, with combo of the big pad underneath that keeps me good. And of course, our bit of camouflage. 
This is my mark. My head should be right here. This is the top of the building. This is from where I'll be taking my high falls. What we have, you'll see in our booth across the way, there's a red and a green light. <laughs> my life depends on it. If there's a problem downstairs and I cannot go for whatever reason, we'll get a red light, which they're demonstrating now. That means abort the fall, come down. I come down and I hide. Otherwise, it's straight to the ground. I take the elevator, the express, whatever you want to call it. See you in the morning. Try doing that seven times a day. When you're putting on so many performances a day, of so many shows, with so many costumes, you'd better have a small army working in the wardrobe department. And then there's the thousands of regular staff uniforms, ride attendants, security, catering, you name it. We have, by order of magnitude, about 6,000 people working here on a day-to-day -day basis. The secret here is that there is no army working behind the scenes in wardrobe. Just a handful of well-trained staff and a state-of-the-art computer system. And this is the check-in point for all of them. A hundred different types of uniforms go out. And hopefully, they all come back at the end of the day for cleaning and running repairs. Keeping track of more than 50,000 garments would be impossible if not for this plastic card. When staff arrive at work, they present their universal ID number, which is entered into the system. All staff members have their measurements and job descriptions recorded. When they arrive to work, their ID number is entered, and their correct information is automatically retrieved. The system is even programmed to pick the right uniform for each season. The clothes have a computer chip sewn into them. So at any given moment, the wardrobe department knows exactly who is wearing what. That's important when you're dressing 600 people a shift. And no uniform is worn for more than a day before being laundered. One day on, one day off. Next, we'll find out what the Japanese did to that great American icon, the burger. And you'll be surprised when we reveal the biggest star on the Universal block. The... Universal Studios Japan showcases the great Hollywood blockbusters and superstars. But you may be surprised to learn that the most popular character at the park is not a movie star at all. The star attraction is a 50-year-old beagle called Snoopy. Before opening the park, Universal did a survey to find out which characters were most popular in Japan. The results were surprising. Snoopy polled better with younger children than any of the Disney characters. But the real shock was that Snoopy's biggest fans are affluent female office workers. Well, Snoopy is very, very popular amongst women mainly, about my age or a little bit younger, um, mainly because we grew up with it. We grew up with Snoopy just l like the Americans have, and it's ever so cute. There are two dedicated Snoopy areas at Universal Studios Japan. Snoopy's Playland and Snoopy's Soundstage Adventure. The Japanese people love Snoopy's, and they love to buy the cotton cloth Snoopy doll. We also have a Snoopy called traditional Snoopy. That's a Snoopy which wears a kimono, and it's sold very well. Kimono Snoopy is the big mover in this shop. So much so that they've developed an entire range of traditional Japanese Snoopy giftware. 
that Snoopy store has sold more merchandise by almost double compared to what we expected. So just on all counts, it's a very big success. A big part of a visit to any theme park is the food. It's hungry work going from ride to ride and from show to show. It's also hungry work standing in line. Visitors here have a sweet tooth and an appetite to match. The number of cakes we produce a day is about 4,000 pieces. As for the bread, we make about 10 to 12,000 items a day. How about a serving of Jaws Jello? or a chocolate Snoopy. More than 130 pounds of sugar goes into these delicacies on a daily basis. When Universal planned to build a park in Japan, they put as much thought into the food as they did for the attractions. At Universal Studios Japan, the food looks American. Kind of. But there's a secret to this burger. It's actually a cake. A test kitchen was set up in Japan. Ten chefs from Japan and the United States tested 4,000 recipes to develop US-style dishes with a touch of Japanese flavor. We are an American theme park here, and we try to keep basic theming to be American, but there are obviously many dishes that we've adjusted as we've been here, and, and uh, the term that we use is Japanizing the food. So, for instance, maybe instead of a side of potatoes, there's a side of rice, uh, and a lot of the ingredients and a lot of the seasonings would be designed to appeal to the Japanese palate, but also trying to keep an American theme, so it's been a tough balancing act. Even though we're very attracted to American food, we go back to our nursery food, which is the rice. In the Western culture, of course, it's in some places bread, some places it's potatoes, but in Japan it's rice. And therefore, I need my rice, and I'd eat my rice with fried chicken, I'd eat my rice with hamburgers. It's an old cliche, but the Japanese trend is to shrink everything, including that great American icon, the burger. When in America, the portions are too big. We like our, our meals to be small, but lots of it. That seems to be the way uh, we like to eat. For example, the burger we prepare is about two-thirds the size of an American burger. On the other hand, we offer guests a steak which is larger than usual for Japan. It's about 8 ounces, which is smaller than the average American steak, which is about 16 ounces. There are more restaurants than rides at Universal Studios Japan, and head chef Takuo Ishizuka prepares enough food to feed a small city each day. It's very hard to estimate, but if there are roughly 50,000 people visiting the park, we provide the guests with about 200,000 meals. Burgers and rice? Just call it rock and roll. This cultural blender has produced some surprising results. <laughs> E.T. the Extraterrestrial is Japan's second highest grossing film of all time. Titanic is number one. But 20 years after it was made, E.T. is as popular as ever. <laughs> the universal E.T. experience comes with the personal touch. When visitors check in, their name is entered into the computer. And after climbing aboard your starbound bicycle and winding your way through one of the largest sound stages in the world, the star of the show is there at the end to farewell you by name.
behind the scenes, one of the most intricate cinebotic systems in the world is controlled from here. Sixty-eight computers activate the two and a half thousand separate commands for the characters and effects used in the ET experience. But for all its high-tech gadgetry, there's still a touch of Eastern superstition. This little mascot is actually a good luck charm. They call it Daruma, and its job is to keep an eye on things so that nothing can go wrong. Of course, the biggest fans of E.T. are not the kids. They're the parents who were growing up when the Spielberg classic was first released in 1982. And that can cause problems when it comes to who minds the kids while mom and dad enjoy the ride. Universal has come up with a simple solution. This is a parenting area near the entrance to the ride. One half minds the kids, while the other goes on the E.T. adventure. When it's Dad's turn, he goes straight to the head of the line. That way, everyone's happy. In fact, there's a parent exchange attached to most of the rides at Universal Japan. Who said the kids have to have all the fun? go away because we're about to take you places the public never gets to see. The unsung heroes of Universal Studios Japan are the special effects teams. For example, shooting a tin can from long range and hitting it 10 times out of 10 would take an Olympic sharpshooter. Of course, it's all done with gadgets. In this case, the can is hit not by a silver bullet, but by a highly pressurized jet of air coming from underneath. It's all choreographed like a ballet, and the technical director controls the action from here. The control guy, he's, he's our eyes, he's our ears. They're the fifth cast member or the sixth cast member in this show. You have this invisible hand that's bringing up the effects, that's bringing off the pyro, that's more or less pulling all of our safety. And so you feel him through every moment of the show. The preparation for the show has to be meticulous every time. Every effect is tested and double tested. It's the same show each time, but one technical hitch could spell disaster. You can't have a Wild West show without a few pyrotechnics. For the guys laying out the charges, there is no margin for error. Now here's something the price of admission doesn't get you. A view of the show as the technical director sees it. Here's the secret. He keeps us uh, safe. He, he keeps us on time. Uh, he's our rhythm maker. So the techs here are just as important as any of the actors. And maybe he doesn't get quite as many accolades as the rest of the, of the group, but he's still there. The TD operates all the special effects and gives the actors their cue. In a show like this, he has to see them at all times. There's even a camera mounted at the bottom of the well. So when our star is ready for his cue, he gives the TD a thumbs up. The coast is clear. And bam. It's a dance, it's, it's a choreography, and, and we're all dancing together, and it's beautiful when it works out right. In the land of the rising sun, Universal Studios really comes alive after the sun has gone down. Just outside the gates of Universal is a nightlife to do L.A. proud. This is called City Walk. There's a 50s-style drive-in restaurant and a hard rock cafe. 
But the real reason people come here is for the shopping. You want a souvenir? Well, there are eight and a half thousand different souvenirs to choose from. The majority of them can only be found at Universal Studios Japan. The giving of gifts is an important part of Japanese culture. It's customary to return from a vacation with a gift for your family, your friends, even your boss. Every time I go away, I have to buy gifts for the boss, gifts for the clients, gifts for my mother, gifts for the next door neighbor. I don't know where it started, but it's a gift giving culture. It's about appearances, but it's also about the fact that um, we bring back something for people who didn't get to go away. Now, here's the secret to shopping at a Japanese theme park. Don't leave it to the last minute. The reason? One. The locals are obsessed with buying lots of gifts. Two, they don't like carrying their gifts around all day, so the last minute rush is inevitable and formidable. It's been a remarkable cross-cultural effort to bring Universal Studios to Japan. The city of Osaka has a 25% stake in the park. The hope is that Universal Studios Japan will help turn around a depressed local economy. So far, it's working. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. I'm not sure that they like going to all theme parks. I think the theming of ours, named after blockbuster movies, which have been a big hit here, the touch of the American that we have here, I just think are all very powerful influences, because not all theme parks, frankly, are uh, successful here. The secret to the success of Universal Studios Japan? Kids. The park has been designed to appeal to the youngest generation of Japanese. Because wherever they go, moms and dads will follow. And once they get past that famous Universal Globe, there are 18 different attractions, 24 restaurants, and more than 20 merchandise stores to keep the whole family interested. Well, I'd say it is very inspiring to walk out and see what has happened to make this really the most successful theme park ever in terms of the milestones that we've achieved. It really shows the idea of taking the best of the best, improving upon it, and uh, building a theme park with that basis to it. Right now, the most successful theme park in the world is Tokyo Disneyland. Universal is aiming to take that number one spot with Universal Studios Japan. There's no doubt Hollywood has been a point of connection between the United States and Japan. And as you look around, there are some signs that need no translation. Try to get.